Good morning. How are you guys doing? All right, I have a question real quick because I want to make sure I say the right things to you guys. How many of you use GitHub right now? <laughs> that's so awesome. All right, that's good because I'm not going to talk about GitHub per se. What I'm going to talk about is something a little bit different and I think more important, a bit of a meta message, if you will. So what I'm going to talk about today is really about decision making. And I think a better way to make decisions. And that's by thinking and working from first principles. What do I mean by first principles exactly? Well, I mean, take something that's very important to you. Something that you can't really get to with just pure logic. Something that's a fundamental, something that really just speaks to you. Something you believe in. And taking that as a foundational principle to the things that you work on. Building from there, because so much of what we do, so much of what everyone does these days, is just imitation. We do things because we think it's the way it should be done, but really only because that's the way that other people do it. So working from first principles means going back to those fundamental truths that can't be proved by anyone but yourself and starting there. But you have to be careful when you do this. You guys familiar with Game of Thrones? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. In case you're not, I'm not going to spoil it for you. I have to be careful what I say here. Now, there's something called the Stark Principle. And what this is, is it's that you have to be careful because when you work from first principles, you might go too far. In Game of Thrones, there's this character, Ed Stark. He believes in honor. This is a first principle for him. The problem, though, is that he believes in honor so much and so hard that he gets into a little bit of trouble. He loses something very important to him. <laughs> and so you have to be very careful. And this is keeping the Stark principle in mind when working from first principles. So with those things in mind, what are we talking about today? Well, let's talk about freedom. Freedom is one of my first principles and one of the first principles of GitHub. So what, what can we do with this? If we start with freedom, if we start with freedom as an axiom of our work, of our decision-making process, then what can we do with that? What decisions can we make and how can we make those decisions better? Well, something that's been in the news a little bit recently is, is this topic of licenses, open source licenses. We've recently added a license chooser on GitHub when you create a repository. And we have a website that we launched along with it called choosealicense.org to help you choose an open source license for your project. That's all well and good, but you know, most of us aren't lawyers and it's really pretty boring to read massive amounts of text. And even if we read it, we wouldn't know what it meant anyway. So choosealicense.org is there to help you navigate through that by making some suggestions for you. But even then, it seems somewhat arbitrary. Do we even still know what those things mean? Well, maybe we can make a choice of what license to choose by working from first principles, by thinking about freedom and how it affects our decision making. So you might think, well, I love freedom, and I want my code to be available to anyone for any purpose. I think this is a noble cause, this is a noble desire. And so you say, well, the public, let's, let's put my code into the public domain. I mean, public domain, it's in the public. That's an awesome word, phrase, public domain. It's in the public, it's available for everyone always. But that's problematic because really there's not a lot of legal precedence or machinery to take something that's copyrighted, something that you create, and give up your rights to it and put it in the public domain because that's what the public domain is. It's really the absence of copyright. And to, and to just give your copyright away to someone, to remove copyright from the equation is very hard in this country and in most countries. So that's a problem. When it comes up, well, there's no reliable way to put something in the public domain. And in other countries, they might have a different sense of what public domain means. If you say, I want it to be in the public domain in the United States, well, other countries might not think 
that that's in the public domain or whatever their version of it is. So public domain is not really the best solution if you're working towards freedom, to give people as much liberty as possible to use your code in whatever way they want to. So strike that one. So then you become interested in these other sort of esoteric licenses like the WTFPL. It stands for the what the fuck, what the fuck, public license. Do what the fuck you want, public license, all right. The name itself can be problematic. Um, but there's other ones, like the beer license. Like, you can use this code, but if you do, next time you see me, buy me a beer. Okay, well, that's, that's cool. But also problematic from the perspective of the Stark principle. Because companies, especially, are very uncomfortable with these licenses because they're overly broad. It's very hard for a company to enforce that when a developer sees you the next time, that he or she will buy you a beer. So that license is out. You can't use that. The, the lawyers at your company won't really, it just doesn't make sense. And that, re that restricts the freedom that you have. It restricts the freedom that you want to give your users of your software. The WTFPL is very brief. Really, its only clause is do whatever you want. Okay, well, what does that mean? I don't know. It's so, it's so broad as to really be almost useless. And in fact, it leaves out one very important thing, which is a limitation of liability. And in fact, on the WTFPL page, they say that this really isn't, in its shortest form, supposed to be used for code. If you want to use it for code, then they have a limitation of liability clause that you can add. But once you do that, then, well, it's, it's not really funny anymore. So that one's out, all right? Which brings us to the MIT license, which is freaking awesome, all right? The MIT license strikes a balance between the maximum amount of freedom that you can possibly give someone with your code, not restricting them really in any way, but also avoiding the problems of the Stark principle where you become too invested in the idea of your thing. And so let's look at it very quickly. It's so short as I can fit it on one slide and you can actually read it from the back of the room. So this first section says, essentially, this is a license to grant you unlimited use of this software to use, copy, modify, merge, publish, distribute, sublicense, and or sell copies of the software, and to permit persons to whom the software is furnished to do so, subject to the following conditions. OK, so that first clause says, Basically, do whatever you want with the software, but in terminology that lawyers actually respect. Okay, so you're granting, in good terminology, good legal terminology, the rights to anyone that uses your software to do pretty much anything with it, including incorporate it in software and sell it without distributing it. The next paragraph says, okay, all of that, but this other thing. Right? This, is, this, is one of, this, is, I'm sorry, this is one of the other things that, that is required, right? So you can do anything you want with this software except these two things. You have to include the copyright notice, this file, with your software in copies or substantial portions. All right, easy enough. Because you want to make sure that people who receive it and modify it, that who they distribute it to can do the same. Give them the maximum amount of freedom. Okay, number one, very easy. Number two, this is the limitation of liability. And this is important. This is very important because software and anything that you sell has an implied license or an implied warranty. A warranty that says, this thing is what I say it is and it will work for the purpose that I am selling it to you for. Now, are you selling open source code if you put it on GitHub and distribute it to people? Maybe, what counts as selling? If you accept pull requests and merge them in from users, does that establish compensation for use? It's fuzzy, right? But what you have to be careful with is you have a warranty, an implied warranty. And unless you explicitly give up or, or say that that warranty is not in effect, that the software is provided as is, then you could be held legally responsible for this software. And that's what this clause is for. And this is what prevents you from suffering 
the Stark Principle. So this is about as short as it gets. This to me is the perfect license right now. And if you want to do the best thing that you can for open source, and well, you're at a conference called the Open Source Conference, so seems like maybe you would, then if you have an open source project, how many of you have or contribute to an open source project? Almost every single person in the audience. If a project that you work on or some code that you've put on GitHub or on the internet anywhere does not have a license, the best thing you can do for freedom, if you believe in freedom as a first principle and want to give people the maximum rights to your software, go into your software and add this license today. Go do it. Unlicensed software, software without a license, is problematic. People can't use it. That is the maximum way to restrict freedom is to not have a license. So give this one a shot. You might also be wondering, well, what about the GPL? Well, this is why the GPL is not focused on freedom. It's too long, too many restrictions. So what else? What else can we decide when we work from first principles and take freedom to be one of those? Well, what about how to build a company? Many of you here write software. As software developers, we have a unique ability to create companies. Many of you, I'm sure, will at some point in your future found or create or be very influential in the formation of a company. So how can we make decisions based on freedom when we're building a company? To me, it's freedom is about removing things. It's about the minimum amount of stuff necessary to create a functioning system and let freedom blossom from there. At GitHub, we call this philosophy business minimalism. It means only add things when absolutely necessary. When we feel the pain of something, we add process. That process must be designed to help the people in the company. So one thing that we've done is really issue traditional hierarchical management because adding large hierarchies and levels of management is a way to restrict freedom. And so we say, we don't have traditional managers because I don't believe that traditional management is compatible with freedom. Management is about subjugation. It's about control. So we have a different stance on this and it derives from freedom and that is Embrace the reality of a group of people working together. And GitHub today is 192 people. What we embrace is this idea of a highly networked group of people where the structure of the company is dictated by the communication channels between them. So we have teams with team leaders and decision making coalesces into those teams. They have a high degree of autonomy. And then the connectedness that ends up looking a lot like this graph, this graph is actually a graph of the social connections on GitHub. Our company reflects that, it looks very much the same. So remove barriers to freedom and let people work on the things that they care about by being connected to other people that will be affected by those decisions. This drives us to create internal tools that help us figure out who's working on what. But people do that themselves. People align themselves to the projects that they find important because that's part of freedom, the choice to work on something that's interesting to you. This ends up in a, a solution, a system of working that's called open allocation. It's coined by this guy, Michael O. Church. He has tons of writing on organizational structure and philosophy. It's really interesting stuff. So the system of open allocation is about creating great products or allowing developers and everyone in a company to work on the things that are most important to that company in a real way, not in a way where some manager, some boss gave you a list of things to do and you sat down and did them. Using freedom to accelerate and amplify each individual's possible contribution. That's open allocation. And when it's in play, the projects compete for developers because no one's telling you specifically that you have to work on something. Versus closed allocation, the normal way that people do things, which is you're told what project to work on, and now the developers have to compete for the best projects so that they can work on interesting things. And it ends up looking like this for us, because you have to have constraints a little bit or you suffer the Stark principle, which is you believe in freedom so much that everybody can just do anything that they want. That gets you into trouble. So there's a constraint that we have, which is you can work on whatever is most interesting to you 
as long as it is also important to the company. And that's about connections to strategic goals of the company. If you combine those two things and you work in the middle where they overlap, then you create what you really want, which is happiness. So I think if you work from first principles, and especially if you start with freedom, then you can finish with happiness. Thank you.